Welcome back to the course Life of Christ in the second half of class 55. And in this class, we want to imagine some of what Jesus may have done uh, in the days after his resurrection and before his ascension. And I say imagine because really uh, the Bible doesn't give us a whole lot of information about what Jesus did during this time. Uh, I mentioned at the end of the last video uh, and ask you to dream about this, kind of think about this question. What do you think Jesus did with these days? I think it's a fascinating question. And I can think of a number of different things that he might have done or people that he might have seen. But we say imagine again because there's really only about five days or so that are accounted for out of the 40 days that Luke mentions he was on earth after his resurrection. And so what did he do with the rest of those five days and the, the 35 days? Uh, if you look at the possible chronology from what we know in Scripture so far, uh, and the, the 40 days again comes from Acts. Luke mentions it in Acts 1-3. Uh, we have day one uh, where he had his resurrection. That was that Sunday, the first day of the week. Uh, that's pretty well documented, the appearance to uh, Mary Magdalene first, and then the disciples on the road to Emmaus, and then he appeared to the apostles in Jerusalem. So that day is fairly well accounted for. And then we don't know much about the next few days. And it says in John 20 also that the next week, eight days from then, in other words, a, a week later, uh, he had his second appearance to the apostles in Jerusalem and Thomas was there. And I would have loved to have seen Thomas's face when Jesus said, Thomas, come here. <laughs> Wonder what he felt like then. Uh, and then we have a day that's mentioned where he met the disciples on the shore of the Sea of Galilee, and he cooked breakfast for them. And that's the time when he ate breakfast with, or he, he talked to Peter after that breakfast. And then we have the mention of the time on the mountain in Galilee. Uh, and again, uh, for a long time, I thought that Jesus gave the Great Commission in Matthew 28, and then he ascended to heaven right from there. But we know that's not true because we know that he was in Galilee when that happened. Uh, but we know he ascended from the Mount of Olives in Jerusalem. And so the day of the Great Commission couldn't be the day that he ascended up to heaven unless he repeated it that day also. And it's not recorded, uh, but it, it doesn't look like it's the same day. And so it's possible, I guess, that um, uh, after day eight, after he appeared to the apostles in Jerusalem, maybe sometime during the following week, then they headed back to Galilee because they knew Jesus was going to meet with them there. And we don't know what they did during that first week or the second week. We don't know where Jesus was before he met with them in Galilee. Again, it's interesting to imagine where he might have gone in Jerusalem or somewhere else. Uh, but then when he meets with them uh, on uh, the shore of the sea for breakfast, uh, because of the geography, we know that that shore, that place, is pretty near the Mount of Beatitudes. It's within a mile or two. And so it would have been really easy for them to have gone out fishing from Capernaum, where they normally did, to see Jesus on the shore and have breakfast. After Jesus chat with Peter, then maybe they headed over to the Mount of Beatitudes, which was just down the road. And then from that mountain, Jesus gave them the Great Commission. So that all could have happened on one day, uh, and maybe not on on uh, two different days. And then you have another day where he's in Jerusalem. They're all in Jerusalem. It's shortly before the ascension. Now we're looking at material from Acts 1 verse 4 and following, and also Luke 24, 49. We know he's in Jerusalem on the Mount of Olives, uh, and he's about to ascend. Uh, and then uh, we know that on day 40, uh, that is the actual day he's there, and we know he's on the mountain because that's the last of the 40 days, and he ascends up to heaven. So if you look at that, uh, that's only uh, six days at the most that are accounted for, maybe only five. And so after that, you think, what else could he have done? <laughs> now, I'd love to be able to talk to you and hear what you say or think about this. I'm sure you have a lot of interesting ideas. Uh, but I want to share just a few possible ideas with you, and you may have already thought about all of these, or maybe some of these are new, but to me it's fascinating to think about how he used this time with different people. Uh, I believe that probably uh, a number of the days, depending on who he talked to, 
a number of the days he had conversations with people that couldn't quite believe he was alive. <laughs> and so I think that he probably spent part of the 40 days convincing people, yes, it's really me. I'm not a ghost. Um, I believe that, in fact, I know Acts 1-3 says that he spoke to them about the kingdom of God. And so we know that a, a, probably a chunk of his time as a rabbi with his disciples was spent teaching them more about the kingdom. Uh, I think that it's very, very likely that if they're in Galilee and they're all together, then maybe a silence kind of fell on the group. Maybe they're sitting around the fire one night and they start to think back about the last night of Jesus' life and they begin to remember uh, the Last Supper and what they didn't understand and how Jesus had told them that he was going to have to be arrested and tortured and then killed, but that he would come back to life and they probably thought, that night, how, how could we not understand that? And then they probably remembered shamefully a little bit, shamefacedly, uh, that they fell asleep that night in the Garden of Gethsemane, that when he was arrested, they ran away, most of them, uh, that they didn't believe at first the reports of the women. Uh, and so I think perhaps a number of conversations took place with Jesus about the events of that last night and that last weekend of his life here before uh, before he was killed and then those days right after he came back. And, and probably they, they said, you know, what actually happened? You know, what were you thinking there in the Garden of Gethsemane when we were asleep? Um, what, what happened the rest of the weekend? Where did you go uh, when you were in the tomb? Um, you know, what did you think when you came back and people didn't really believe that you had come back, just all kinds of questions would have come up. And I think that Jesus uh, could have given them lots of information about what happened. I had a scholar one time that was talking about uh, Mark's account of what happens in the garden. And the scholar said, um, we actually uh, don't know because everybody was asleep and Jesus was by himself. So how could any of the gospel writers have known what happened in the garden? And so he assumed that those were the gospel writers making up what they thought might have happened in the garden of Gethsemane while all the rest of them were asleep. And I think, what a terrible explanation. <laughs> you're, you don't understand how it happened, so you're going to assume that it's not true, that the gospel writers made it up. I think this idea has a lot more merit. They had time with Jesus afterwards, and they asked him what happened, <laughs> and then they could write it down. I think that's a much more likely thing. And probably a lot of conversations about uh, these last 35 or 40 days, probably they looked back at his whole ministry and asked him questions about that. Oh, so when you said this or when you did this, oh, that's what that meant. I think a lot of conversations were probably about that. Um, and then uh, I imagine that he spent a large amount of time during these 40 days visiting with those who were close to him. Uh, his mother, Mary, of course, um, Martha, Mary, and Lazarus. A lot of stories to tell there. Maybe he and Lazarus compared resurrection <laughs> stories. Um, Joseph of Arimathea, whose tomb he used and said, okay, Joseph, I'm giving you your tomb back. I'm not going to use it anymore. Uh, really interesting there. Uh, and so many other people who he might have talked with. Um, I would bet that he also made visits to houses where he had healed people or people he had resurrected. Maybe he visited Jairus' house and had supper with that family, or the widow of Nain and with her son and had supper with them. Um, I wonder uh, if he went back to visit some of the Roman or Jewish leaders that were his enemies. Uh, I would have loved to see it if he went back to Jerusalem in that first week after he appeared to everybody on the first Sunday, uh, if he appeared in Pilate's Antonia Fortress in Pilate's office, for example, or maybe in his bedroom one night, or maybe he went to visit Caiaphas, the high priest, and said something along the lines of, here I am, now do you believe me? And you can't do anything else to me because I'm already, I've already been killed and I've been resurrected. Now will you believe? I wonder if he went back and talked to any of them, uh, if, if maybe they would have believed somewhat. Uh, I wonder if he went and found the centurion that had declared that he was the son of God while he saw him after he just died on the cross. I think those are endlessly fascinating ideas, and you imagine those conversations of what it must have been like. 
And then I think another thing he did during the 40 days uh, was to teach them about how they were going to plant and develop and nurture the church. Because when they get to Acts 2 uh, and the church begins and so many people are baptized and then it launches, uh, they had the Holy Spirit with them. They had the guidance of the Spirit in every step um, and every believer. Uh, but I believe that Jesus probably gave them some information about how the church might be different, for example, from the synagogues that they had been in as Jews and how the church was going to include the Gentiles. Uh, perhaps he mentioned that. <laughs> Maybe that was one of those things he said, but they didn't quite get because it took him a while to accept the Gentiles later. But I think he talked about the church uh, in these days. And then perhaps maybe one night after supper, uh, maybe he pulled aside Matthew and, and maybe Mark, if Mark was there with Peter again, and John and said, you know, it'd be good if you could write down uh, what you guys remember about the ministry because that news needs to be shared with other people. And so they write the Gospels that are the good news. I think that's possible uh, that uh, he talked to them about what they might share with other people uh, and uh, what might be in each one and perhaps how the Gospels might be different as we see they are. And so all of these things and many more, probably many more that you've thought of that I didn't, I think are really good possibilities for how he spent these 40 days after his resurrection and before his ascension. And so then we get to Luke 24, and we get to verse 45, and they're almost done. Uh, he says, then he opened their minds so they could understand the scriptures. And you think, wow, at this late date, <laughs> finally their minds are opened. He told them, this is what is written. The Messiah will suffer and rise from the dead on the third day, and repentance for the forgiveness of sins will be preached in his name to all nations beginning at Jerusalem. There it is again, maybe talking about what was going to happen on Pentecost. You are witnesses of these things. I'm going to send you what my Father has promised, but stay in the city until you have been clothed with power from on high. Okay, and if you jump over to uh, Acts, let's just uh, take Acts 1, 1 through 8. Uh, what Luke does at the end of Luke and the beginning of Acts is kind of an overlap. So that the ones who read Luke then pick up where Luke left off in Acts 1. Uh, and here's what Acts 1 says. In my former book, Theophilus, I wrote about all that Jesus began to do and teach until the day he was taken up to heaven after giving instructions through the Holy Spirit to the apostles he had chosen. After his suffering, he presented them, himself to them and gave many convincing proofs that he was alive. He appeared to them over a period of 40 days and spoke about the kingdom of God. On one occasion, while he's eating with them, he gave them this command, do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift my father promised, which you have heard me speak about. For John baptized with water, but in a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. Then they gathered around him and asked him, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom to Israel? He said to them, it is not for you to know the times or dates the father has set by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. And so we have these final instructions in Luke and then repeated somewhat in Acts 1. And then uh, you see again a double telling of the ascension. We're going to take Acts' version since we're there. Verse 9, after he said this, he was taken up before their very eyes, and a cloud hid them from their sight. They were looking intently up into the sky as he was going, when suddenly two men dressed in white stood beside them. Men of Galilee, they said, why do you stand here looking up into the sky? This same Jesus who has been taken from you into heaven will come back in the same way you have seen him go into heaven. <laughs> That's another one of those stories. It's just a little bit humorous. Uh, why are you standing here looking up into the sky? <laughs> and you can just imagine they're just looking up and, and they're just awestruck and, and just maybe struck dumb. And they're thinking, well, because we've never seen anybody float up into the sky before. Uh, but, you know, with Jesus, anything is possible. And when he says, when the angels say, they'll come back in the same way you've seen him going to heaven, maybe it meant, uh, you know, through the air, because later on Paul talks about meeting Jesus in the air. Um, and then also maybe it means, you know, coming back from the same direction. Maybe heaven really is from that direction. And so we have the account of the ascension. Now, again, where did this happen? So we go 
to a panoramic shot of Jerusalem from the south. Uh, here is the old city today. Here's the Golden Dome of the Temple Mount there. Uh, here, all along here is the Mount of Olives. And so one of the possible sites is this tower right here, uh, which is the Russian Tower of the Ascension. Uh, that was built there to mark that as a possible spot. Uh, once again, we don't know for certain where the exact spot was, but we know it's Mount of Olives near Jerusalem, all that, so it fits the basic criteria. Another place just a little bit down the ridge of the Mount of Olives is the Dome of the Holy Ascension. It used to be a mosque, and if you go inside the dome, this is kind of what it looks like here. And then if you look down at the floor underneath that dome, uh, this is the traditional site of the last footprint of Jesus on earth. And again, this is where I get a little bit more cynical and say, ah, I'm not sure how they could know that. Uh, but again, we know he was on the Mount of Olives and this could have been close to the place. And so it says after they heard from the angels that Jesus was gone, he was coming back. Then they return to Jerusalem uh, and they wait and they don't know exactly how long it's going to be. They don't know it's going to be just 10 days to Pentecost, and the church is going to start in Pentecost in Acts 2. Uh, they just know they're supposed to wait to be filled with the Holy Spirit, which again we see happening in Acts 1, uh, verses 12 through 26, and then in chapter 2. So let's read the very final bit out of Luke chapter 24, the last two verses of the gospel. It says, Then they worshipped him and returned to Jerusalem with great joy, and they stayed continually at the temple praising God. Amazing stories, and again, ones we like to think about uh, what might have happened during these days, and it gives us lots to look forward to, because we know that in some fashion, uh, we'll be similar to Jesus. We will meet him in the air. Uh, we'll eventually spend eternity with him in heaven. Uh, so it's exciting to see kind of a foretaste of what might happen. We'll see you next class.